so welcome everyone uh, apologize for the uh, problem i have no idea how any change occurred uh, with regards to the passcode or link but uh, a good bit of us are here uh, today we're going to hear from kostov saha kostov is a phd candidate uh, at uh, georgia tech his research interests are in social computing and computational social science uh, and uh, he uh, adopts machine learning, natural language processing, causal inference analysis to examine human behavior and well-being using social media and online data, along with um, complementary multimodal sensing data. Uh, he has a very long list of um, published work um, and, um, and also uh, some exciting internship that he has been part of. Uh, he is in the group of Munmunda Chaudhary, um, who um, has uh, led a work in a uh, general area related to depression and mental health, especially involving social media. So uh, with that, uh, uh, and, and, and this is the uh, uh, seminar related to AI and neuroscience position. With that, uh, over to you, Kausto. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Shed, for the great introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm very honored to, uh, to have the opportunity here today. Now, before I begin, I'll start with a little bit of personal motivation. So during my undergrad, I saw a number of student deaths, including suicides. Now, these events always affected me or my classmates as we could relate ourselves so much with each other. Now we always wondered with the what ifs, like what if we knew or what if we could have done something about it. And over the years, I developed a keen interest in computer science, language, and health. And I was admitted in this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and human-centered computer science program at Georgia Tech. And I started working on problems that somewhere always made me curious about. These include measuring and understanding health and well-being of populations such as college students, and to do that, I've used the skills that I've developed in NLP, machine learning, causal methods, and social media data. Now, as a brief intro, Professor Shit already introduced me, but I will just quickly go over it. So I did my uh, undergrad from IIT Kharagpur, and I have had in full-time and internship experiences at various places, most recently at Microsoft Research and at Snap Research. And I'm very thankful to be recognized as a GVU Foley Scholar and a Snap Research Fellow for my PhD research. Now, recall back that I mentioned about well being in my very first slide. Fundamentally, what do we mean by well being? Well being by itself is a very broad concept and it extends beyond traditional definitions of health. Higher well being indicates that, in some sense, the condition of an individual or a group is positive and they feel happy and productive. Now, traditionally, well being is measured via survey instruments consisting of self-report questionnaires, which ask the individuals to summarize their experiences. Now, although very accurate in snapshots, surveys rely on retrospective recall and are reactive in, reactive in nature, such that they can only be conducted after an event has occurred. So research recognizes the value of in-the-moment data gathering, such as via EMAs or ecological momentary assessments. And with the advent of ubiquitous technologies, EMAs can now be incorporated by smartphones. However, this kind of sensing suffers from limitations related to compliance and adds participant burden as they seek to actively engage the participants. Therefore, passive sensing modalities have become of prime interest as they do not require the participants to be actively engaged and allow us to collect the data in an unobtrusive manner. Smartphones, wearables, and social media, all due to their ubiquity and widespread use, serve as low cost and convenient passive sensing techniques. Now, I just mentioned about social media. Social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, enable us to share our thoughts and connect with others. And my research brings in this perspective that social media can be used as a passive sensor to examine and predict human behavior and well being. Social media data is self-recorded in a self-motivated fashion in one's naturalistic setting. And this data can be collected unobtrusively to obtain longitudinal and historical data beyond study periods. 
And social media data alternatively functions as a verbal sensor, as it can capture people's linguistic expressions. And the social ecological model, which is the figure on the right, explains the potential of social media sensing for complex human behaviors and well-being. And this model tells us that people's behaviors and experiences are not isolated and are impacted by relationships, the communities that we live in, or by events and factors in the society. And therefore, to get a better understanding of well-being, we need to include our situated context. And to consider situated context, my research focuses on thinking about situated communities. Now, what do I mean by situated communities? So a core part of our daily social lives is often embedded in the communities that we are situated in. Like these could be our neighborhoods, our workplaces, school districts, or residential communities. And here we share social ties, have shared experiences, and we access common resources. And the interconnectedness and interdependencies of our interactions and experiences intertwine our situated context with our well-being. And the lack of timely supportive interventions following events and crises can lead to several negative consequences. And therefore, understanding well-being in situated communities is essential for both individual and collective well-being. And in my research, I focus on two kinds of situated communities, college campuses and workplaces. And here is an overview of my research. So by complementing social media data with complementary multimodal sensing data, I adopt computational and causal approaches to examine well-being in situated contexts. Now broadly, I summarize the novelties and contributions of my research here. I use social media data that uniquely reflect online analog of offline and physically co-located situated communities such as college subject data for college campuses and class door data for workplaces. Second, to make conclusive research claims, I adopt causal approaches that minimize the confounding factors. Sorry, was there a, was there a question? Okay. Uh, this leads to stronger research claims about cause and effect relationships in people's uh, reactions to certain events or environments. And causal questions also help us answer the why is related to well-being, such as why is well-being changing or what factors are contributing to disrupted well-being. And third, I propose methods to address some of the major challenges of social media data, such as the lack of ground truth and the lack of social media presence altogether by augmenting social media with multimodal sensing data, such as EMAs and passive sensing. And finally, I recognize that these computational <laughs> assessments have potential real world consequences. So we need to be careful and meaningfully understand what we are measuring. And therefore a cross cutting theme in my research is a deep dive into a meaningful understanding of online data driven offline metrics. And the figure on the right summarizes my select publications from my PhD in the overarching space of social media and well-being. And my primary venues have been CHI, CCW, ICWSM, Emote, and JMIR. Now in today's talk, we will go over a study on college campuses and one on workplaces. And then in the theme of drawing meanings, I will briefly talk about two of my very recent works and one on an ongoing work on observer effect on social media. And finally, I'll go over my future directions on, and how my current research motivates towards that. So the first study is about well-being on college campuses. So college campuses are situated communities where mental health is of prime interest. And college authorities often take measures and interventions to help the mental health of college students. But how do we evaluate if any of these measures worked at all? Like in this regard, I'll talk about measuring the efficacy of a post-crisis intervention by leveraging social media data. So crisis events on college campuses can have profound negative impact on the well-being of the campus population. And one such frequently occurring crisis is the death of a college student. Here are some alarming stats, like two in every 1,000 US students die every year due to accidental, suicidal, or illness reasons. Now these events not only psychologically affect the campus community, but can also lead to extreme adversities or crises such as copycat suicides or post-traumatic stress disorders. 
and to support the students cope with such crisis, the campus stakeholders take initiatives to reduce the psychological effects. One such effort of post-crisis intervention is public service announcements, where students are sent these emails after every student death. These emails not only express condolences about the loss of a student, but also promotes and points information about various student-centric support resources and counseling services. And we call these college announcements as counseling recommendations as they are intended to reduce the psychological effects of crisis by recommending counseling services to students. And although it is essential to evaluate the effectiveness of these post-crisis interventions, there is no effective means to do so. And with that in mind, in this work, we examine the effects of these post-crisis counseling recommendations by adopting a causal inference framework. Causal analysis is also important as the observed effects could be a result of passing of time or for other factors such as people's ability to heal or cope with crisis. So we use social media data of online college communities on Reddit. Reddit is a social media platform which is very popular among the youth and has this college subreddit communities. Like for example, here is the homepage of Argatic, the online college community of Georgia Tech. In this community, students discuss and share about their academic, personal, and many other aspects of campus life. And the counseling recommendation posts are also shared on these subreddits to help their outreach. So we identified those individuals who engage on these counseling recommendations and examine their psychosocial changes. Now to tease out the effects of a particular kind of counseling, college announcements, that is counseling recommendations after student deaths. Alongside, we built three other baseline datasets, which datasets relate to the college announcements in various combinations of the presence of a counseling recommendation and the student death event. Like for example, in the table here, B2 concerns those counseling recommendations which are sent without student death events, such as following immigration restrictions. And B1 concerns generic college announcements such as adverse weather or administrative changes. Now we queried 174 college subreddits and collected their entire timeline data of every user who engaged in these discussion threads. Now diving into the methods, we employed a causal inference framework where we define the treatment as exposure to counseling recommendation posts and drawing on the literature on how people cope with such crisis, we examined the outcomes in terms of effective behavioral and cognitive changes observed in these individuals. Now, ideally causal inference problems are best conducted using randomized experiments where the treated and controlled groups are recruited and researchers run dosage or no dosage on them in the same controlled environment. Now, however, such a setting was not feasible in our case for practical and ethical reasons. And therefore, in an observational data setting, we matched the treated and controlled groups such that each pair of treated and controlled users are very similar, except their exposure to treatment. And the treated group consists of users exposed to these counseling recommendations where we conservatively define exposure as commenting on the posts. And we obtain the control users by finding the most similar non-exposed users using a number of covariates such as we match users in the same subreddit accounting for offline and local factors as they belong to the same college campus. Now we adopt a two tier matching framework where in the first step, we match them on the Reddit activity using a propensity score matching model. And in the second step, we match them on the psycholinguistics using a Mahalanovich distance measure metric. Now matching minimizes the confounder such that any differences in observed outcomes could be attributed to the only major differences between the treated and control groups, which is being exposed to the counseling recommendations. Now, drawing on the crisis response literature, we examine the outcomes in terms of effective behavioral and cognitive changes. I'll briefly go over the effective changes in terms of grief, and then we'll look at a summary of all the psychosocial changes that we studied. Now, affective variability is common after crisis, and in this work, we study affect from the perspective of grief because of its contextual relevance. Now, grief is a response and a mix of conflicting feelings and emotions by which individuals adjust to the death of someone close. Now we model grief using natural language methods and contribute a grief lexicon, 
where we model the grief lexicon on social media language using Russell's uh, complex model of affect. What we do for this is first we identify grief communities on Reddit and find their most salient keywords. And then with the help of a new affect dictionary and word embedding similarities, we find the affect categories of these grief keywords. Now this helps us obtain the grief lexicon in Russell's uh, complex model where every grief category is mapped into two dimensional space of valence or positivity or negativity of the state and activation or the energy level. And the figure on the right shows the top keywords in the grief lexicon, where we see a mix of different effective keywords and the size of each bubble quantifies the relevance to grief. Like for example, love occurs in the first quadrant with positive valence and activation and anger occurs with negative valence, but positive activation. Now, without going into details of all the findings, here's a summary of what we observe in our data. Compared to their match control of users, the treated users showed greater expression of grief in effective changes, greater interactiveness and diversity of interest in behavioral changes, and improved linguistic and cognitive processing. Also, these effects were not observable in the case of any other kind of college announcements, which I mentioned like uh, adverse weather, immigration changes, or even administrative changes. And therefore, in most likelihood, these changes were caused by the counseling recommendation force following student death events. Now, situated in the crisis and expressive writing literature, these changes reveal improved psychosocial well-being. So this work complements existing methods to assess the effectiveness of post-crisis intervention efforts and could be used to build tools to track campus student morale, which can be very useful to make proactive interventions on college campuses. Now, these would also require collecting the data prospectively in real time. And in today's talk, we will also see what could be a challenge in doing that. And next, we'll switch our attention to another kind of situated communities, that is workplaces. And here again, my goal would be to employ social media as a passive sensor or source and use computational approaches to study well-being. Now, many of us have been involved in some kind of job. Now, have we ever wondered how the job description of the job when we get hired varies from what we eventually and actually do at our jobs? Now, this is exactly the notion of role ambiguity and I will talk about how LinkedIn can be used to measure it. So role ambiguity is the discrepancy between what an employer expects and what an employee does at an organization. It occurs when there is a lack of clarity either in the definition or expectations of the role. And literature outlines that role ambiguity can lead to many negative consequences like uh, dissatisfaction, distrust, lack of loyalty, low performance, and well-being such as anxiety and stress. And therefore the raw knowledge of role ambiguity is important and traditionally it has been measured by survey instruments where individuals record their perceived clarity of assigned tasks and expectations on their roles. And these are structured questionnaires which ask the which could miss the aspects of the role that the individual undertakes and can also have other biases. Uh, in recent times, LinkedIn has emerged as the primary platform for professional social networking. And here we self-describe and self-promote our professional portfolios to either seek new jobs or to use it as our professional web page. Now in this work, we ask, can we use LinkedIn to better understand an individual's role? And with that in mind, in this work, we have three research aims to measure role ambiguity using participant consented LinkedIn data and to validate the measurement of LinkedIn-based role ambiguity or Libra by theory-driven hypothesis on the relationship of, with individual well-being and job performance, and to investigate what factors may contribute to one's Libra relating to intrinsic traits, platform characteristics, and the goals of using LinkedIn. Now to understand our measurement approach of Libra better, here's an example. The figure on the left is the LinkedIn profile of an individual who works as a software development engineer at a company. And the figure on the right is the job description of the same role as posted by the company. Now we essentially quantify Libra as the differences in what is described on the left and what is described on the right. Quickly about the data, we obtained LinkedIn data of participants who also provided survey and other well-being data. 
And to drive our measurements, we used ONET, where ONET is an online database and job ontology that consists of self comprehensive lists of jobs and the descriptions. And there are eight job description categories ranging across abilities, interests, knowledge, skills, work styles, and work values. And from a methods perspective, we used word embeddings to assess Libra. Word embeddings are essentially vector representations of words and phrases in higher order like latent lexico-semantic dimensions. And we quantify Libra as the Euclidean, Euclidean distance of vector projections of LinkedIn descriptions and that of job descriptions across the job dimensions. Now, we wanted to validate how accurate is our measurement of Libra with respect to established survey measure of role ambiguity. And we find a Spearman correlation of 0.22 between Libra and survey-based measure. Now, while this is significant on, this, on the surface, this might not look like a high correlation, but this could also be because of a number of factors such as one is perceived, whereas the other is objectively measured using a frame of reference. And this also motivates us to evaluate our measurement on the basis of theory-driven hypothesis, such as greater role ambiguity is known to be associated with increased heart rate, increased stress, decreased sleep. <clears throat> and with respect to job performance, role ambiguity is known to be associated with decreased task performance and decreased citizenship. Now we studied a, studied a relationship of these measures with Libra by controlling on demographic and intrinsic attributes such as gender, age, educational level, income, executive function, personality traits. Now, all of our hypotheses were supported, also validating our assessment of Libra. Together, we find that Libra relates to depleted well-being and depleted performance. Now, what was the point of doing these assessments? Let me talk about some of the practical motivate implications. Like from an individual's perspective, we can think of self-reflection tools where they can self-assess on their skill set and productivity at work. From an organization's perspective, this can benefit worker training programs and companies can identify the areas of training in a much better way. Companies can also conduct better informed role matching and internal hiring of teams. And here, like for example, the, here's a visualization that can be used in building dashboards that track role ambiguity across employees and across job aspects. But, but given the potential implications, we also investigate how these new sources of online data may bring in new dimensions to consider while making Libra-like assessments. First, organizational behavior of different individuals may contribute to differences in LinkedIn self-presentation, like some individuals may be looking for new jobs, whereas some may be very settled at their work. And proactive behavior, which is change-oriented and self-initiated behavior of different individuals, may make them work on more aspects than what is expected of them. Now, while this is desirable behavior for companies, it may also affect the work-life balance of the individuals. Also job-related factors such as ambiguous job titles like Startup Ninja, Software Rockstars can bring in new complexities. Like companies also tend, up, tend to come up with uh, cool job titles, as I mentioned, or higher job titles in the lieu of salaries. And different companies may have uh, different policies regarding encouraging or discouraging the use of LinkedIn. Finally, the familiarity or the use of LinkedIn may vary across individuals. Like sometimes people tend to write what their company does rather than what they do in their companies. Also, LinkedIn has this sense of invisible audience and people often do not know who their audience is. And employer surveillance and employee subjective expectation of privacy shares a competing relationship. And the sheer perception of being surveilled can influence an individual's self-disclosure behavior on the platform. This is also very important, interesting from the purview of my ongoing and my future work. Now we will uh, continue our discussion on how important it is to understand the meaning of these data-driven assessments. Like even though these digital data can have significant potentials in understanding our well-being, these predictions are not necessarily perfect. Like these predictions can be used or misused in several ways to make real world and high risk decisions. So we need to critically reflect on these data-driven insights. And in this thrust, I will talk about three studies, two of which are recently published at CSW and CHI, and one is my ongoing work. Uh, in the first study, I examined demographic differences in perceived job satisfaction. 
So job satisfaction is the primary indicator of worker well-being and current approaches to measure job satisfaction suffer from many limitations. Like these methods are expensive and intrusive and are typically conducted within organizations, which amplifies people's privacy concerns, leading to social desirability and non-response biases. And these assessments summarize multidimensional information into a single metric, but different individuals may lay varying importance to different aspects of the jobs, depending on socio-cultural and historical factors, such as individuals from different geographical locales, gender or race can have of, often have different priorities and concerns at work. And these summative approaches may oversimplify the social reality and may suppress the voices of underrepresented groups in the workforce. So aiming to overcome these challenges in this work, we use social media data to measure job satisfaction and to study the demographic differences in perceived job satisfaction by geography, sex, and race. So we measure job satisfaction by two facets, pay satisfaction and supervision satisfaction, where we build machine learning models on theory-driven annotations, where we conduct the annotations by uh, collaborating with organizational psychologists using existing instruments such as job and development index. <clears throat> now, first, it was important to measure this constant validity of our assessments of job satisfaction. So we compared our assessment through existing large-scale macroeconomic data, so what we found was our assessment positively correlates with job satisfaction data collected on a nationally representative survey of 500,000 workers by Gallup. And then we measure perceived job satisfaction by differences by sex. We find that females tend to show greater pay satisfaction than males. And this counters a lot of anecdotal, theoretical, and empirical evidences about gender discrimination at pay and at work. But literature also suggests how satisfaction is a function of expectation, and women tend to expect less compared to men for the same job and skills. And this is known as a job satisfaction paradox, that women might have higher job satisfaction despite being more disadvantaged in the workforce. And this kind of paradox can lead to inconclusive and misleading insights about workplace satisfaction. However, because we also examined multiple phases of job satisfaction, the figure on the right shows us that when considering only supervision, females are a lot less satisfied than males. Now studying linguistic differences, we found how social media language reflects that the majority groups express mostly about career growth, salary, intrinsic job aspects, Whereas the minority groups such as in gender women or in race um, or, or minority groups in race uh, or geographical locale express mostly about basic needs, flexibility and minimum wage. And reflecting back on the previous slide, we see how females saliently expressed about toxic workplace and harassment, whereas males concerns were around wealth and tax. This shows us, shows us that if we go beyond blanket assessments, Social media data does reflect unique demographic disparities in our needs, priorities, and concerns. And this study is an example of how social media data-based assessments can be misleading when only looked at superficially. For example, women to show greater pay satisfaction. However, deeper investigation revealed the unique demographic disparities in needs, concerns, priorities of different individuals at the workplaces. And the key insight is that although satisfaction is an important aspect at work, aspects like fairness and equity should not be ignored. And the workers should be paid what they deserve and not just what they are satisfied with. So I wanted to discuss another study on life events, uh, but I would uh, probably skip that. So because we are not doing well with time and I was also want to leave some time for questions later. So, but, I'll go over some of my ongoing and my future work now. So, so basically, I'll sum, first summarize what are the broad takeaways that we discussed so far. We found the potential of social media in examining well-being in situated contexts. We also found the feasibility of causal approaches to overcome confounds and introspected into the meaning of the data and assessments. And my draw, work draws insights on observational and retrospectively collected data and has implications for prospective and real-time applications. And one of the very reasons for, for doing, doing this kind of work is that now, because with the knowledge provided by these studies, the goal is to now improve well-being. 
like college campuses and campuses and workplaces can build AI technologies that can proactively understand its members and accordingly use interventions to improve well-being. But when we start thinking about well-being and thinking about interventions, we need to prospectively collect the data. However, the question is how would these algorithms perform in such prospective settings? Like individuals may start altering their behavior compared to what we find in retrospective data. In fact, a number of critical researchers highlighted the pitfalls of such systems in practice. The in-practice reliability and efficacy of such human-centered technologies suffer due to, the, due to the unpredictability and complexity of human behavior, along with unaccounted for confounds. <coughs> Sorry. For example, Lazar et al. noted how the Google flu predictor algorithm that uses Google search behavior overestimated the number of flu visits in real time, even though it performed exceptionally well on historical data. And similarly, given the success of passive sensing and in situ settings, and as we consider real building real time applications, one assumption is that individuals may remain truthful and behave as they normally would. But what if individuals become aware of being observed and adjust their behavior differently from normalcy? And then passive sensing may not remain so passive after all, and we may have to adjust our findings accordingly. And my ongoing work intends to examine this phenomenon of observer effect in social media behavior. So going back to the social ecological model, although we advocate naturalistic study settings, this model also points out that observers or researchers can also become a part of the subject's ecology and may affect the subject's behavior. And this phenomenon that people may start altering their behavior if they feel they are being observed is called the observer effect. But before investigating, I asked, can observer effect be avoided? And the answer is yes. Like we can conduct retrospective and uh, studies on retrospective and observational data, but but the studies are uh, settings are not applicable in many cases, such as identifying historically unobserved behaviors or conducting a proactive intervention. And alternatively, we can just conduct studies and interventions without participants' awareness, such as the Facebook emotion contagion experiment, where uh, participant feeds were modified for experimental purposes. Now, these studies can make great research findings without being impacted by the observer effect. But these also raise the questions of ethical violations. And only a few researchers have privileged access to conduct such studies. And so to avoid the trade-off and for best research practices and feasibility, observer effect remains a basic unexplored phenomenon that may impact research findings in human-centered studies. Particularly when we consider social media sensing, this effect is more likely because Social media participation tends to be a form of intentional and conscious behavior or behavior that, participate by, by, that an individual can alter at their will. Now, from a methods point of view, I'm conducting a synthetic control-based analysis where I compare the deviation of real data against the synthetically prepared control data, which is modeled on the expected behavior of the participants from their historical behavior. Now, here are some of the expected contributions and implications of my ongoing work. I intend to pro provide insights regarding observer effect in social media behavior in terms of questions such as, does it even occur? How long does it last? And how does its occurrences vary across participants? And from a methods point of view, I, this work will provide a causal framework to quantify then infer observer effect in longitudinal sensing studies. And I also intend to recommend strategies to correct biases to the observer effect in social media sensing studies. Now, this brings an end to my on existing work in my today's talk. But for the interest of time, I did not elaborate another critical component of my research, which is about using complementary multimodal sensing. I'll briefly go over it now, and I'll be very happy to talk about it later. Now, when we, while we saw some of the potentials of social media data, it, this data also comes with limitations like it is sparse, not everyone is equally active, and there is also lack of ground truth. And my work has addressed some of, the limit, some of these limitations using complementary multimodal sensing, which helps us obtain a holistic understanding of an individual. Like I've leveraged EMA to address the lack of ground truth, 
and multimodal passive sensing to impute missing social media data. And I've also used multimodal offline sensing to contextualize person-centered predictions, which I would very briefly explain next. So typically we build social media-based prediction models or motion prediction models on the entire data set that we have. However, social media use and language may vary tremendously across individuals. Now, while this challenge we can overcome by building more personalized models, social media data also suffers from sparsity issues. Like if you consider me, I'll have data on a Monday, on a Friday, and then probably at the end of the month. And therefore, in this work, we balance the trade-offs between two personalized and two generalized models by contextualizing on offline behaviors as captured by a multimodal passive sensing. So basically, if you see the bottom figure on contextualized approach, we first found very similar behaviorally similar individuals using multimodal passive sensing. And then we built separate models of behaviorally similar individuals to predict the psychological constructs. Now, these models can effectively capture between individual homogeneity and within individual heterogeneity in our behaviors. Now, this brings an end to my existing work and I will, we will talk, transition into the final phase of the talk. Now, building on my existing work, we will now go over some of the future directions on social media, well-being, human-centered machine learning. Now, I have thematically grouped them into methodological, topical, and ethical interests. And I'll go over some of my future plans in the next few slides. In the methods team, I will build human-centered approaches that tailor to an individual situation's demands and needs. Like we may be familiar with the one size does not fit all phase. And the same also applies to computational and data-driven methods, more so for human-centered me methodologies. And I intend to use complementary offline and online data to build these models, which would also motivate more individual-facing technologies for stakeholders. And next, I want to build and evaluate the in-practice utility of these assessments. Like I'll build upon my observer effect work in evaluating the in-practice validity and in designing online well-being interventions such as peer student support communities. Now I'll expand this body of work through experimental studies of how certain interventions help or do not help individuals on online platforms. And I recognize the sensitivity of this work and I plan to collaborate with mental health support volunteers, psychologists and clinicians, along with platform owners and the members of the communities. And in the topical space of situated communities, which has also been a focus of today's talk, I plan to study problems on future of work and well-being. Like the pandemic has likely, for example, the pandemic has likely evolved the definition of situatedness in these communities and has also reinforced our realization about the importance of technologies in our lives. And I want to develop technologies that leverage the advantages of virtual interactions, overcoming the challenges of the, due to the lack of physical and face-to-face -face interactions. And I aim to leverage online data to build technology-mediated proactive assessments of metrics such as worker satisfaction, worker coordination, behavior, and organizational culture. Now I want to solve problems associated with the challenges of work and technology-assisted works like the remote work settings has led to uh, overlapping boundaries of personal and professional lives leading to new forms of stress. Also new forms of disadvantages and disparities might have began like uh, workplace culture now needs to incorporate remote collaboration and dynamics. And finally, a cross-cutting and an independent team is on understanding and delineating the harms versus benefits of this line of work. Like despite the potentials, these works also come at a cost like even though there are best of intentions, this can cause harms, like there are lingering questions about the best practices, about algorithmic inferences of real, -time, real world measures. These algorithms can be misused in ethically questionable ways, including compromised privacy, defying expectations, and damaging the trust between individuals and technologies. And I will develop approaches that balance the trade-offs of the risks and benefits of these data-driven human-centered assessments and this line of work will revisit and recommend guidelines towards transparency and accountability. And I'll end with some open questions in the problems that I discussed and more generally in the problem space, like, and which the questions which also open up future directions to think, evaluate and address. And like there is a lack of ground truth in the understanding of ground truth and what does it mean to be ground truth and how do we collect that? 
Also, how do we ensure that these methods benefit beyond those who afford or use these technologies? And these assessments can be misused and findings can be misinterpreted or to reinforce existing societal biases. And we also need to think about the ways to navigate through harms and benefits. Now, these questions are both challenging as well as opportunities to strive towards building better technologies for well-being. And we need to critically reflect and study these questions and bring together multi-stakeholder viewpoints to realize the research and practical impact. Now that brings an end to my today's talk, but it would be incomplete without thanking all my mentors, advisors, uh, collaborators who have been of great support in all these years. And I'll re leave by revisiting my slide on the novelties and contributions of my work. And I thank you all and we're very happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Um, really, at least from the perspective of some of the work we do, we, um, uh, you know, I really enjoyed uh, the, particularly the issues that you have taken um, and and uh, they're, they're fairly novel in, in the, um, and, and timely. Um, well, Thanks. open to the questions. I had more time to talk to Kostov, so uh, others have priority. Yeah, and I skipped the work, but but I would be very happy to talk, uh, talk any question. And please feel free to send me any questions that we might have. Right. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. You always intended to, you know, uh, let the talk go a little further, so we have time. Don't be shy, guys. Uh, um, then I can start if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Sure. Uh, Costo, it was a great talk. Thank you very much for uh, giving this talk to us today. Um, it was very interesting to learn about uh, about your work. Um, it was great. So my question was about the Libra work. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, I was just wondering, so as far as I could uh, see, you use word embeddings and the uh, call sign and also uh, you're uh, computing the uh, correlation uh, between them and uh, I was just wondering what was your motivation when you're choosing these techniques to right. make ambiguity no that's a great question very good question and I think uh, one reason why we did that is that first I would like to clarify there's there's a measurement and there's a validation part of it so I think for measurement, we did not, we do not need anything else other than say LinkedIn profile and say the job description. That's it. It's, it's a very unsupervised approach and it doesn't really need anything else. But as we all know, like, like if given a data and using some machine learning or AI methodologies, we can always come up with something, but role ambiguity is already theoretically defined in say organizational psychology in say organizational science literature in some way. And that is based on a survey-based measure. Now, now the new measure that we have come up with, new measurement that we have done with say, machine learning methodologies, how is that different or even similar, or even even or whether it is even related to what we have in how it is this measure is defined? Now that is why the validation aspect of it becomes very important. So, like basically, that is why we did multiple kinds of validation. One is how it is. Uh, one is a based on like how it is exactly measured using surveys. So basically criterion or construct validity sort of thing. So where we found a correlation there, a significant correlation there. And the other kind of validation was that role ambiguity is known to have a relationship with, this is the theory driven hypothesis thing, role to have this relationship with individual stress, performance, sleep, these kinds of things, which is why we also did the regression models with the Libra and say other, these kinds of measures that we have. Now, because we did two kinds of validation, this gives us more confidence and more robustness about the measure that we picked. But uh, to answer your question, does it answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. I mean, I wonder whether I can ask a question. <laughs> Sure, yeah. go ahead. After that, Diplo, and after that, Utkashni, and then- Okay, I will make it very brief. <laughs> but no, go ahead, we have plenty of time. Okay, all right. 
thank you very much for your fantastic talk. It's uh, just uh, you know quite amazing because uh, your your research lab has done fantastic job in this area. You know, it's uh, top notch research. You know, well done. So my question is basically regarding a very general uh, you know data extraction from social media. For example, on Twitter, right? So because of the privacy setting, how are you actually, how, uh, what is your practice in terms of extracting demographic information? The Twitter user or Facebook users, you know, their races, their age, their, you know, location, all this kind of more private information. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think the best practice for doing that is uh, consenting, uh, consent uh, to data from participants. So like, for example, um, I mean, I skipped over this data slide. Uh, I didn't explain it much, but basically in this study, we recruited participants who shared with us their Facebook data, LinkedIn data, and also other, um, other wearable data, and also answered through answer to surveys, like which include demographic surveys, as well as individual differences like personality traits and those kinds of things. But uh, to answer your question, yes, those are the, uh, those are very important to be, uh, accounted for because going back to the privacy points that I was mentioning, there is two aspects of it. One is privacy considerations as well as one is privacy implications. So privacy considerations is the one, is that what we do during our work? We like, even if it is a public social media data, we kind of uh, anonymize the posts, we de-identify the posts, we uh, only a specific set of researchers have access and not like we like again, we do not like the mental health models that I was talking about. So we have mod built models with depression, anxiety, stress. We do not really make them public like on GitHub, like most machine learning or AI researchers can do with their models. Now, this is because because this can be used in very um, negative ways. Like, what if insurance companies use them to uh, understand the mental health of individuals and then? Um, provide or deny claims based on it. Companies use them to uh, hire or fire employees based on it. So I think this is why, uh, and this is where the privacy implication of the aspect of the research comes into play. Like, like, like and that is a, that is a nice, uh, interesting trade-off that researchers also need. As researchers, we need to think about like the, between the transparency and the consequences of research. So even though like we are making the algorithms, the methodologies public, and then someone else can replicate it, which is why it's also important to find proper ethical guidelines of what can be done and what cannot be done. And it goes back to, final point I'll mention, it goes back to one very interesting aspect, like the social media platforms were never, like how, the, what was the meaning of the social media platforms? Like these were created for us to connect with others, to interact with others, to make friends, that sort of thing. Social media data was never really created to analyze us. Now, if we start using these technologies to analyze us, it can change the whole ecosystem. It can damage trust. And, and again, like even not just algorithm, algorithm, from an algorithmic point of view, we do not need to, we, only, we also need to account for these biases and trade-offs, but also is it something that we want? Like this kind of disruptive intervention, is it even ethically um, uh, good to do that? I think that's also a question that we need to ponder about, yeah. Great, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so indeed, uh, I think uh, that you just uh, ask a very important question. I'm wondering that uh, if the, the head, the director of your team, your group has uh, signed some kind of contract with uh, those companies because I ever heard a friend of mine uh, mentioned to me that uh, he previously wanted to use uh, the uh, smart uh, watch uh, data, uh, his own smart watch, and uh, he got some uh, legal trouble. So just wonder if you, your team ever uh, encountered a similar issue and how did you handle it? Oh yeah, yeah, so we encountered a lot of issue. I mean, so firstly, I would say that we do not really like for, for all this research, we did not really have any partnerships with say these uh, like Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies. But having said that, I think uh, like during this data collection, uh, when we were doing the data collection, we built Facebook. So basically Facebook provides APIs using which we can collect participants data if the participant consents. 
So that's also very important part. The participant needs to authorize using the OAuth authentication that I'm consenting to provide this data to these researchers or something like that. But uh, what happened during our data collection was the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened in 2018. And during that, everything just fell apart. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like basically Facebook uh, stopped using that API. They changed a lot of um, parameters and going back to the previous uh, question, uh, previous question, Facebook kind of disabled access to say things like birthdays, gender, uh, location, those kinds of things. But but we we were fine with that because we we had the survey based data from for participants. But 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 these kind of challenges like challenges come up or like during the data collection and also companies tend to change their policies and the APIs accordingly. But having said that, recently of late, companies are also because of so much of bad PR and everything, companies are also starting to form new partnerships and collaborations with academia. Like, for example, uh, Facebook is sharing their data with researchers for some studies. Twitter recently opened up um, their data, data platform for, uh, for academic research. Microsoft is opening up their, um, their language models, like, which, is, which is a big thing, like the, whatever happens, like search and all those things, but the language models opening up for research. I think these partnerships I mean, the better way to go forward is also to build these partnerships to get a better access to data and, and also conduct the research in a more ethical fashion. Yeah. Professor Srivastava had a question. Yeah, hey, Kostav, uh, thanks for a great talk. My quick question was um, a meta question based on the, all the previous uh, things, which is, uh, what is your thought about having replicable experiments in this setting? because you're relying on social data and all these things, right? Which are restricted by people and so on. So how do we set up replicable experiments, especially not um, if I want to replicate your experiments or you want to replicate my experiments, right? Uh, which is using these kind of social data. So, yeah. No, I'm so glad you asked me this question because that is something that I always wonder. And it kind of also goes back to the transparency aspect of it. like. We cannot really make our models public, and, and like even though the community encourages like to make models public and those kinds of things, and so that someone else can also run studies and see how replicability is on on different set of data. And similarly, we can also cannot also make all the data of our, ours public. So I think, but but which is also there for a good reason because I mean it can have bad implications and it can uh, have challenges in doing that. But I think my thought about uh, the replicable experiments is that uh, we have done different sorts of studies, like for example, the depression, anxiety, stress classifiers that we built on Reddit data. We sort of also use them on say, another talk like community data or say Twitter data or say Facebook data. We have sort of also used them there, but, but for doing that, we also needed to do additional levels of validation. Like uh, like we we needed to repeat that like qualitative and ex, um, expert validation aspect of that those uh, research because those models do not exactly translate and based on that sometimes we also need to tune it for the models but but this is what model aspect of it I'm talking about but I think at a more meta level I think replicability is very important and it goes back to it also is somewhere ties around the reliable like the in practice reliability aspect of it like. It worked on historical data, but will it work on new data or will it work on another data? Will it work on another population? So yes, this is very important to conduct those kinds of experiments, those kinds of validation before we actually use them, these systems in practice for on a the, on the different population. So that is definitely important. And also social media data has its challenges. Like, like there is self-selection, there, uh, there are different sorts of biases. Like, we are only studying who are on social media or who choose to disclose on social media. So what about those who are not on social media? So will how will these models perform on that? And I think one way to think of it this way is that we need that comprehensive, like complementary multimodal sensing aspect of it. So basically it also goes back to that, what is ground truth, that question. Like there are so many aspects of finding it's the same ground truth. And like even the Traditionally, it has been said the surveys are kind of the ground truth or gold standards. They are not because they also have biases. 
the social media data are also not uh, prone. Like similarly, it's also prone to biases. So similarly, so which is why I think it's important to com complement and combine them together in some way. But yeah, replicability is extremely important and trans tra replicability, transferability is very important, like how it models work on from one problem to another problem. And I think some form of domain expertise and customization is extremely important in uh, like, for example, job satisfaction model may not work on, say, clinical population. So I think that sort of thing is very different. Um, so there's a question from Utkarshni, who is in India. Um, very interesting work. Could you please elaborate on generating synthetic data for counterfactual analysis in observational study? Right. So I think um, uh, I, I very, very briefly talked about it. And it's, uh, uh, like, to oversimplify, this is kind of a, only a uh, fancy and name in causal inference thing, but basically what it is kind of, uh, we have say uh, data from historical uh, historical behavior, like say uh, by behavior, I can mean say number of posts or what kind of language is being used, that sort of thing. So we have a historical behavior and now some intervention happened and we find the behavior, like real, real world behavior of the individual. But we want to ask, what the behavior would have been if this intervention did not happen. So for that, what we are doing is that we are also trying to uh, find what could have the behavior been based on the historical behavior, the kind of model and expected behavior too, which is the bottom line. So that is the counterfactual. So basically what would have happened if this, uh, this intervention didn't have happened. So that is where like, I mean, we can think of the auto regressive, regressive models where uh, the model itself can predict what would like uh, happen after a, a certain time based on seasonality and trends and those kinds of things. So I think if that kind of answers your question. So basically that's the expected behavior. We have the actual behavior, find a deviation between the two, then do some statistical significance test and see whether this is significantly different between the two. And then we can kind of, at least in some way or the other, we can say that intervention led to blah. All right, Pankesh. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Jianjun, uh, 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 go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, so, so essentially, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I really like your uh, talk and a lot of your work and very active uh, research. So I do have one question. So essentially, <laughs> Um, if I, I'm asking you, what is what is the uh, uh, in your opinion, what is the the most urgent uh, um, um, you know problem that you want to solve and uh, that can be can you you know because uh, because I look at your work, it's more like um, applying you know all the AI machine learning to solve the you know social work problems, right? A social work problem, you can, you can uh, some simple, you know, emotion detection, just kind, kind of many of the simple natural language tool application problem, uh, but those kind of problems you cannot get funding, you know, right? So if you want to get funding from NIH, from NS, you must have a very, you know, a, a, a significant critical, uh, you know, social problems. So what is the problem? Do you have this in mind? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, like you asked a great question, like, um, so firstly, I would say that, um, like emotion detection and say, so sentiment analysis was one of the, I think, the, I mean, you were right, that one sentiment analysis was probably one of the first things that people started to think that uh, language can lead to understand sentiment, but I think it has gone much more deeper and much more, uh, detailed constructs that we are studying. And these are, these, and the way this, I approach these problems that here is a problem, it is hard to solve using existing approaches. And this is where the data or the methods come into play. And that is kind of uh, like a kind of a different approach compared to say, here's the data. And then we uh, drill into it, we explore different approaches and see what can be built up on the data, which is also great. Like that is how the models are built. And you were directly pointed out that that the best possible models, state of the art models come from those kind of approaches. But whether those models work on humans or human-centered problems, that is where I think the uniqueness of this kind of problem that we are studying comes into play. And also there's a lot of uh, domain expertise that goes into it, a lot of validations that go into it. And 
And it's not just quantitative, but also I would say the domain expertise, the interpretation, the qualitative assessment. I think those are also uh, unique and combined together. That's where the uh, distinctness of the work comes into play. Uh, having said that, I think about the funding opportunities, I think there are plenty of funding opportunities uh, in this line of research. Uh, for example, uh, from, a, from a methodological and research background, I'm kind of uniquely solicited, uh, situated, and that's, this is a slide that is about the, to seek grants from federal agencies like NIH and NSF. Like future of work is an important theme at NSF. Mental health and causal inference is an important theme at NIH. Algorithms, technologies, and social justice is an important theme across the board. And also going back, like going back to the another question here is that I also need to partner with so uh, partner with and solicit grants from industries and nonprofit organizations, like companies such as Google, Microsoft, and Facebook have thematically driven year-long research grants, which also al align with these research interests. If that, if that answers your question. Uh, I would like to see some very specific, uh, for example, like mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, in mental health, you know, what kind of problem that you think is, exist that need uh, energy funding to solve? You know, that's my. I want you to give a, a very con more concrete, uh, uh, yeah, application also, scenario. Yeah. Also, there are plenty of problems in that, and and so even for like even in my research, I've studied problems like. Uh, what are like studying the effects of antidepressants using social media data? The example of the first problem that I gave that how certain mental health interventions work or do not work, I, I, identifying the effectiveness of that. What is the real world utility of this kind of data for understanding mental health? Uh, this is this was an important theme. It has been an important theme, and there will have been multiple funds on studying the effects, uh, mental health effects of COVID nineteen. And in this regard, we studied this problem that how the people's mental health has changed during COVID-19. And like for the, the plot here shows where we kind of show, found that in the first three months of COVID-19, that initially there was a huge spike in people's mental health, like depression, anxiety, stress, suicidal ideation, or the support that they sought increased extremely during the COVID-19. But what we also found was after a certain while, this kind of came back to normal. But also this, this kind of work shows and helps public health officials. It also helps uh, things like, what are the major concerns? How do we provide tailored support and interventions in this regard? So I think that those kinds of problems. Yeah, yeah, You're okay, yeah, thanks. Actually, this is, uh, you know, uh, some of this is uh, part of uh, RO1 funded to yeah. uh, the advisor, I, if I believe. and. Um, just as an example, I have had two R01s and two R21s in these kind of things. So right. there is plenty of funding uh, in, in this general area. Okay, uh, next. Anybody uh, else? So, Kosto, this is Pankesh. Hi. Uh, Kosto, so I have a very generic question. So, mm -hmm. regarding uh, what was your experimental setup for a multimodal sensing uh, mm -hmm. uh, research? Mm -hmm. And second thing, since you have been considering sensor data, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so have you considered uh, uh, anomaly? Because this sensor data have a lots of anomalies and those aspects yes. are there. So yes. that might be affect the outcomes and results. So have you considered those yes. aspects uh, yes. while considering while conducting the experiments? Yes, yes. So, so I would um, give um, uh, two answers to it. So basically, I would not consider myself at, at least now, I would not consider myself uh, like a, someone who can develop sensors, like uh, like for example, wearable sensors, smartphone sensors. I'm I'm not an expert at like using sensory data for doing say activity recognition or sleep detection, those kind of things. But my in my research, what I do is uh, kind of you like whatever data that comes into from sensor, those go go in as features in my models. I think um, if uh, that is how I would like to characterize myself. Uh, regarding a question, second question, that's a great question actually that about anomalies and that is something that we have also been studying and this kind of is a follow up to kind of the work that I skipped. That was, um, so basically it was about life events on in individuals lives. And we, what, we, what we were studying is that how different life events may lead to uh, differences in people's behaviors and also anomalies in these sensors. So I think that is one form of anomaly detection, like anomaly in 
uh, anomaly detection problem, like anomalies in people's lives. That is the kind of problem that we have been studying. And again, like um, uh, like there are uh, people who I collaborate with who have been uh, like studying problems related to uh, anomalies in say, uh, so basically one kind of anomaly in social media, even in social media sensing is after a while people tend to stop uh, using social media. So I think in those cases, how do we use non-data as also a signal to understand people's behaviors and health also becomes a question. So yeah, I mean, I would say like I have not directly uh, modeled anomalies as of now, but I am very interested and I've, I've studied problems in, in the space of anomaly detection somewhere or the other. Like for example, the life event problem is like when life events happen, like when uh, a person experiences an accident or a death in a family, how their behavior changes, understanding that from sensory behavior is something that I've studied. Thanks, thanks, Costa. Mm -hmm. What a great question. Thank you so much. Well, with that, uh, we'll uh, end the uh, this uh, call and um, uh, the seminar. Costa, thank you very much. And uh, I think you have a busy schedule ahead of you today. So we'll talk to you soon. I think uh, so there was some.